like when I was a kid, I would go to church, right? And I'm sitting there and I was a wild, crazy kid, like the Kung Fu movies and like everything little boys like guns and, and karate and all this violence and fun, aggressive boy, man, a boy should like. And I would go to church every Sunday with my, with my family. And I'd look around and I would look at all the men there and I would think, I, I don't, I can't really, I can't relate to any of these people. I can't relate to the other kids. I'm just not fitting in here. There's something off with them. Like the men were just not men. They were just kind of soft. There was like a woman was there with like her full grown son who she called her husband was there. And you said something that Christians have kind of turned into pussies. And I, I was thinking back, I'm like, that's exactly what I was feeling all the time in church. I was like this, I, I couldn't stand it. That's probably why I got away from it, seeing what it was doing to men. So I want to get your take on like, what is the current state of like the, the religious or the faithful man in general, not, not in our world, but. What's up, freaks? Welcome to a special episode of the Steve Ecker Show podcast. And normally it's just me sitting here rambling, talking a whole bunch of shit by myself. But with this event coming up in Tennessee that I'm about to go and attend, I had to interview my good friend, Gabriel Alexander. So we're going to go deep into this event coming up. But first, I just want to get, get started about where this all started from. So Gabriel Alexander is a visionary entrepreneur, multiple business owner, elite men's performance and results coach business and brand consultant, a speaker, and the founder of the Freeman Forge Men's Event and Coaching Network, which is what I'm talking about coming up here in a couple weeks in Tennessee. He is a family man, alternate alternative education champion, servant of truth, and the author of the forthcoming works, The Ungovernable Man. Gabriel, what's up? What's going on? Man, it is a beautiful day. I got to say, it is. there's nothing like connecting with you first thing in the morning to get the juices flowing, get my heart pumping, and ready to go. Happy to be here. Thanks Hell yeah. This is this is two days in a row for us. Just yesterday you were interviewing me, and now we're here we are again two days in a row. What a, what an awesome way to start the fucking week. Yeah, you are like nitro to the soul, man. I thought I was an intense individual. <laughs> and I got to connect with you, and I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> awesome. Looking, looking forward to it. Looking forward to digging deep into it. Before we go deep into the event coming up here, in Tennessee, which I can't wait for. I'll be taking my son with me, Tyson, and, and we're just talking about it nonstop. We can't wait to go and do this. Before we get to that, let's let's take it back. Like, how how did you even get into this? How did you get into this calling of serving and helping these men forge themselves into, into self-governed leaders, as you call it? How, how did that even start? Where did that come from? And I'll try to keep the story as short as I can. But in all reality, this has been my entire life. I was born the first of five sons. My my parents were a you know a pastor and pastor's wife, typical you know traveling all over the country, living in different places, leading different churches and whatnot. And so, I grew up in a sea of testosterone that I was very comfortable with by nature. Uh, I think a lot of my gifting was always to shepherd and to help guide and to help protect. Also, being the firstborn, I think that's kind of just a natural role that you fall into. But I think my parents knew something when they named me, uh, they, you know, Gabriel Alexander, Gabriel is man of God and Alexander means defender of men. And it was just always something that came very naturally to me, whether it be, you know, loving on my brothers, helping them grow, fighting alongside them, or just, you know, when I started to get older, I got out of my own home and I really gravitated toward helping men. I was a high school basketball coach for a period of time in my early twenties. The guy who coached me in high school actually asked me to come and coach, and I fell in love with watching the transition and the transformation that can happen through having access to a young man's life from just the beginning of a season to the end of a season. And once I had a couple of parents come to me and say, Gabe, our kid would not have done this. We he, we don't even recognize him. The things he's attempting right now and the toughness that we see in him, we've never seen before, and we know that's because of you being involved in his life. Um, I could say... At about the age of, I want to say 20 years old, my mom actually sent me an article back before we had cell phones when you could kind of send each other pictures. She had carved out an article with a pair of scissors and put 
put in an envelope with a handwritten note to me because I was about 20, like I said, 2021. 20, and I was going, what do I do with my life? What do I give my life to? Now, I had always been entrepreneurial. I started my first company at 19. And so I was always interested in business and I kind of had those things going, but I was longing for a greater sense of purpose and impact. You know, construction's cool, but for me, it was not how I wanted to impact the world. And I'll never forget the article when I opened it up. It was actually an article that was about up and coming careers for the future. And one of the careers that it listed was life coach. And, and my first reaction was, that would be awesome because that's what I do for free. It's what I do without being paid. I love connecting with people and helping them grow. But of course, the first thing that comes up with that is the doubt that you have in your own mind. Who is going to pay me to have me tell them what to do with their life? And here I am 20 years later doing exactly that. But it was a bit of a long road. I was in full-time ministry by the time I was 19, 20 years old. I was speaking publicly. It had always come naturally. Uh, and of course, being raised around it with my parents being in leadership, you're the first one there. You're the last one to leave. And so these things had been ingrained in me since I was a kid. Not only that, but I was educated completely outside the system. My mom was a homeschool pioneer. She actually used to write for the old schoolhouse magazine, which is one of the biggest homeschool publications in the world. I actually just saw it right before we came on here. I saw that your mother was homeschooling. So she read a book. Was that her book that you put in, you sent me about? So she, that was a magazine she wrote for. Her book was called um, Unlocking the Leader Within Your Child, or sorry, Born to Lead, Unlocking the Leader Within Your Child. My parents from a very, very young age began to recognize what was going on in the public school system and what was coming down the pipeline. And they weren't going to tolerate it. And I think really what set them apart was understanding the limitless potential that your children have. And so many parents don't take advantage of it or recognize that potential. So our parents raised us outside the box. We were raised to be entrepreneurial. Whereas most kids get an allowance, we were given an allowance, but it wasn't to go spend on garbage. We had to, to budget out haircuts, hygiene, clothing, school supplies, and they taught us to be responsible with our finance. They taught us about investment. They taught us about starting your own businesses. And I remember, I think the first time I walked around a block putting flyers on doors to mow lawns, I want to say I was maybe eight to 10 years old living in Houston, Texas at the time. And so I was very much raised outside that box, but raised in that mentality of you're going to be different. You're going to live different. You're going to do things differently. And so, you know, age of 20, like I said, I was in full-time ministry. I owned a company at the time. And then I got to see some darker side of church stuff. Anybody that's been around church or ministry knows that there can be conflicts and political nonsense that goes on. And, and when that hit at the age of 20, I was freshly married, by the way, at 20 years old. I think I was a month into marriage when everything kind of hit and I was going to be giving my life to full-time ministry and communication. And I just recognized this is not what God has for me. This is not my calling. This is not the armor that I need to wear to be able to share truth and help other people. And so I went into rock and roll and I was actually in, in the music business for 10 years as an artist manager and a touring agent. And that's where a lot of the skill set was developed to be doing what I'm doing now. And I didn't even recognize it at the time. I just thought I was rejecting church culture and that I was going into rock and roll and, you know, business and all that. But it's crazy to see now all the learning about, you know, events and, and bookings and promotion and advertising all kind of came into play during those years. And then late 2019, I actually experienced some of the cancel culture stuff. One of my clients narrated a book for a conservative author. It went number one on Amazon by accident. And within 24 hours of people figuring out who read it and who was in charge, all my clients' shows were canceled, you know, no more radio play, it kicked off of tours, you know, mm. stuff like that. And there I am Christmas week, 2019, just asking that question, what do I give myself to? I've got businesses that do their thing. That's great. But what do I do? And then early 2020, I'm sitting in front of the TV and they start talking about some virus. And I look at my wife and I'm going like, they're not serious right now, you know, and just I recognized the patterns very early on what was going on. And I started to look around me and same as we talked about yesterday, where are the men? I was absolutely shocked. Now, I was living south of Seattle at the time, but I was still shocked at how many guys didn't have a pair between their legs and enough courage and enough guts to simply say, I'm not doing that. How dare you tell me that I can't go to work and I'm not essential and I can't feed my family? My response immediately was like, yeah, make me. I'm not going to, we're not doing mm -hmm. that. And so long story short is I was 
honestly, at the time I was filled with a lot of rage and anger, which is where I think a lot of this probably men's work comes from. It's just like, what is going on? I've got to do something. And I had just the week before invested in my first coach. I had a guy who wanted me, to, was talking with me about investing myself and and he wanted me to spend a hundred grand with him to change my life in a year. And I was one of these guys I'd never paid for an intangible before. And my mind was blown that you're familiar with this. You see it all the time with the work you do with the MDK project and Bedros and trying to convince men the, of the power of investing in yourself and your future. And I committed to a hundred thousand dollar coaching program that I didn't have the money to pay. And the next day the lockdowns came out and you can't go to work. And, you know, I'm waking up in the middle of the night, my heart just beating out of my chest, freaking out. And I was angry. And I was actually talking to this man, just raging. Where are the men? And he goes, Gabe, he goes, you're asking the magic question. Now, what are you going to do about it? Because I think he saw something in me and he saw what was deep inside and had been curated for a long period of time. And at that moment, I want to say it was late April 2020, I just simply made the decision, I am going to give my life to help men forge themselves into self-governed leaders that cannot be coerced, that cannot be controlled, that know where they stand, and who will not capitulate. Awesome. So so much so much awesome shit there to dig into. First, the the fact how your name breaks down, I think is is so cool. The, the it was the the defender of men, right? Was Alexander and the man yeah. of God is, is Gabriel. Shit, that that's just awesome how you break it down, how it's led you to where you are. My name is just Steve. I'm just fucking Steve, where people call me asshole. I don't know. I, I, so I'm jealous about the whole name thing you got going on there. But then the, also the cool thing about the in the you, how you switched from ministry to a rock band, pretty much rock career almost, like total opposite ends of the spectrum. But each of those was a stepping stone. Everything you do is a stepping stone to get to where you are now, which is so cool how that flowed right into where where you are now. And then uh, on the on the side with your mother, is this the, is it no ordinary child? Is that the book Denise Mira? Yeah, is it no? Or, sorry, no ordinary. Yeah, child. I literally downloaded it right before we came on here and I started listening to it. I just ordered it and downloaded it just to, to hear because I do. We just started homeschooling our kids like six months or eight months ago now. So yeah, awesome, awesome stuff right there. So I want to dig into this. Yeah, the the weak male leadership that you're talking about, but specifically on the faith side. Here, I want to tell you a quick story that you don't even know about that just happened that involves you just a, a, a couple of days ago, which is, it's, yeah. it's fucking nuts. And this is, this is why we're, I'm so much looking forward to this event. So as a, as a kid, I used to go to church every Sunday, but I was never into it. And as, as a grown up, I kind of got away from, I have my own ways of getting into faith. And recently things have been popping up where ideas of faith have been showing their, showing its head. And I'm saying, you know what, this is something I need to dip back into and get back into. So I started reading some books going into some some online stuff, some seminar stuff, getting a little more into my faith, a little more into re, not really religion, but just faith, God, however you want to call it, higher powers, higher being, the creator, getting deeper into it. And as I'm sitting there, um, you had sent me a message about, or I saw you on the podcast that I was on, and that's how we first connected on on Instagram. And that was it. It was nothing, nothing to it really in the beginning. Then I'm sitting there at, at night one night and I read a, I forget what book I was reading. I think it was a book called a new book called manhood. It's a lot about men's faith. And I just finished rereading and re-listening to wild at heart, which is very similar manhood and faith. And I, I ran into some guy in, in Atlanta that was right after I spoke on a podcast, he was talking about faith and men's faith and, and religion and God. And I'm like, you know, these are all these signs coming at the same time. So I'm sitting there late at night and I couldn't fall asleep. And I'm, I'm thinking in my head, all right, if I need to find a way back into some kind of faith or God, I've been away from that for so long. Where are the signs of it? Where are the signs? Where am I, where am I going to find the signs of that? And how are those signs going to pop up? I said, we'll see, because you start thinking that it's bullshit. You start resenting, you start, people start resenting like faith in God because things don't go their way or they just don't see how it's helping them out. They, they want to take credit for it because of our, our ego. So I'm sitting there late at night, couldn't sleep and, and only got a couple hours of sleep that night. And I wake up in the morning and there's literally an Instagram message from you saying, can we get on the phone today? I just got to talk to you about this event. I'm like, all right, whatever. Didn't think anything of it. Didn't connect the dots. Then I get on the, we get on the, our first our call that we had just recently. And you're telling me that you were couldn't sleep at night and you were praying all night about it. And then you just had to message me in the morning. And to me, I was like, holy shit, this is some 
either weird fucking spooky shit or I'm onto something here and I need to be at this event for one reason or another. So I don't, it's just a crazy story how that aligned that literally was going on at the same time that you said you were sitting there praying and, and thinking, and then you just had to call me to get connected for whatever reason. So it was a, it was a calling and and you're doing you're, you're on the right path. I'll tell you that. So that's fucking awesome. No, it's amazing, man. It's crazy how God tells us certain things. And you know, one thing I actually want to go back to for a second that you mentioned is you talked about religion and faith, two very, very different things. When you actually look up the core root of the word religion, it's talking about restriction. It's talking about rules. It's talking about a man-made way to almost kind of put God in a box. Now, I won't argue that I think there are great traditions of faith over time, but one of the things that we've lost is the ability to hear God for ourselves deep down on the inside, God telling us something and listening and obeying. And as men, one of the things we talked about yesterday is the abdication of responsibility. What is the biggest abdication that you can you know, uh, be guilty of in your entire life other than simply I abdicate even vision for the future about what I'm being told, about what I'm supposed to go do? It's incredible that something like that can happen. It's amazing because you didn't even fully tell me that. I mean, you told me you were kind of getting back into faith when we had this conversation. You've been researching, but I had no idea you were going through this. Um, but really, you know, it wasn't just the nightmares all night and the praying. It was this, this sense that I had in the morning of a voice telling me on the inside, the still small voice. It wasn't audible. It's that feeling in the gut of you need to go do this. And I just knew at that moment I needed to reach out to you. But that's again, that's not me. That's just me choosing to listen to the voice inside. But I think that's a very important distinction to make is I'm not a religious man. I am a faith filled man. And there is a difference. And God will reveal himself to you at the right moment to the right people at the right time. And I just think we have to learn to listen to that. That's amazing, man. I'm going to take that. I got to tell my wife as soon as this is yeah, over. It was, it was, it was some weird, freaky, creepy shit. And I was like, all right, let's, let's go forward with this and see what happens. So something, and something you said to me in that conversation, I want to, I want to dive into, and I hope you don't mind me saying it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't is like when I was a kid, I would go to church, right? And I'm sitting there and I was a wild, crazy kid, like the Kung Fu movies and like everything little boys like guns and, and karate and all this violence and fun, aggressive boy, man shit that boys should like. And I would go to church every Sunday with my, with my family and I'd look around and I would look at all the men there and I would think, I, I don't, I can't really, I can't relate to any of these people. I can't relate to the other kids. I'm just not fitting in here. There's something off with them. Like the men were just not men. They were just kind of soft. There was like a woman was there with like her full grown son who she called her fucking husband was there. And you said something that Christians have kind of turned into pussies. And I, I was thinking back, I'm like, that's exactly what I was feeling all the time in church. I was like this, I, I couldn't stand it. That's probably why I got away from it. Seeing what it was doing to men so I want to get your take on the, what is the current state of like the, the religious or the faithful man in general, not not in our world, but in general, in the general population. What is the current state of that religious man or Christian or however you want to call it? Yeah, I want to make sure that I answer that in a as much as I can, a kind way, but also a truthful way. And I think it's what we're seeing in many ways. We're seeing the culture affect the faith instead of the other way around. And so now we've got people that claim that they have convictions and strong beliefs, but because of conflict or fear of conflict, um, the desire to want to be liked, the fatherless culture that we live in, now communities of faith are beginning to look more like degenerate society than the other way around, which is completely backwards to the way things are supposed to be. We're supposed to be sharing our faith and helping to propagate that to our sons and daughters, but also people around us that see the blessing in our lives that it brings and the order that it brings. And we're supposed to be able to communicate that in an effective way so that other people can find that faith and begin to hear from God for themselves and have those same life results. You know, the outward, I think it's it's so important to talk about the outward. And I'm not going to harp on fitness and say that you're not, you know, you're not righteous or you don't know God because you're out of shape. But that's what I do when I walk into a church building. Now I'm in Texas, there's a church on every corner and I walk into a church. If I feel like I can take more than five of these guys in here at once, this ain't the place for me. And it's not because I'm looking at fighting anybody. It's just how am I supposed to do the work with someone who's talking about addiction, who's talking about self-control, and yet you've never heard of a diet, let alone got, gone on one. 
I sat with a pastor a couple of weeks ago where they literally had to bring a stool on stage for this guy who's 75 pounds overweight for him to sit at a pulpit and talk to me about addiction and lack of self-control. Now, I, I'm not triggered. I, okay, that's great. But how am I supposed to take you seriously? The outward world is a complete reflection of what is going on on the inside. And if I have been made in the image of a creator with this gift that I've got, my body, this is how I walk out the spiritual world. It's how I walk out my spiritual obedience in the physical world is through this body. And so I'm looking around and I'm seeing some guy weeping and lactating next to me. I'm not going to take you seriously. Not to say that God can't touch me and bring tears from time to time. But we've gotten to this place where men are no longer leading their families and playing the role that they're supposed to play. We've taken this image of Jesus, who is this loving character. He's meek and mild. Look, that's amazing. But nobody wants to talk about the scripture where Jesus walked up to a synagogue, fashioned a whip in the parking lot, went inside, and it said he drove the money changers out. That, that's not some limp-wristed, everybody get out now. He was cracking a whip in the temple saying, get out. Who are the greatest heroes of scripture? Even the greatest king of Israel ever named in scriptures, King David, and the scripture said he was a man after God's own heart. Yet the people of Israel sang songs about him, saying, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. The greatest men that we've ever seen of the faith or take faith out of it completely, the greatest heroes in history were men of war. They were men that knew what to do with their hands. They were men of skill. They were men of conviction. And they were men who didn't back down. And so we've lost this thing where men are being men and we valued niceness, where you take what you're given, you're agreeable with everybody. And so we've really allowed the church and faith to be feminized as a whole, just like the rest of our society. And I, women have a, a high value. My wife is amazing. She's my partner. She has value. But I also have had to recognize that we're not equals. There is an authority structure that was designed by God since the beginning of time to bring order to mankind. And the world we're living in right now and what we're seeing is the exact opposite of that. But I don't blame women. I blame men. Because men have set, stepped off the throne, they've set down the scepter, and they've said, someone else take care of it, and now we have the world we're living in. Fatherlessness, crime, poverty, and any way you want to look across the board, any data you want to look at, when there is an active father in the life of a child, that child's future is almost set in stone to have a life of success, prosperity, and peace. When you remove that, you're removing the image of God. So like you talked about a couple minutes ago, it's We've gotten to this place where I'm worshiping me. I'm God. It's whatever I want. It's whatever I feel. We are really the problem because we are a species that is made to worship. We're either going to lift ourselves above the mind of God and live according to our own will and principles, or we're going to submit ourselves to the principles that God gives us, which is what ends up bringing peace and order to our lives. So much there, like, and, and I was actually having the same conversation with my son. All these books that I read, he also reads them along with me. He's twelve years old, and we were reading them, and and some of those exact kind of stories you're talking about pop up in these books. And we were just having a conversation yesterday, like about the a lot of the brutality and the fucking crazy stories in the Bible, and and death and war and chaos, and some of the best men were the greatest fucking savage warriors that there were, like straight savages. For good, of course, but that's what it was about. No, no one ever told me that shit when I was a kid. I never, I never really learned that side of it until just the last couple of years, which is crazy. Which is probably what drew, drew me back into it to see. All right, there is a connection here because they did just teach you that nice, feminine, soft, weak, bitch titted, like the, the guy that needs to sit up on a a stool t telling you about discipline and everything else. That's all they taught us, and, and every man was soft and feminine and soft spoken and weak. And are they? Well, what is love? That? I think that's a big question. What is love? Like, what is love for your son? Is it getting him up and making him go work out and better himself? Or is it coddling him, giving what he wants in the giving him what he wants in the moment? Say everything's gonna be okay. You're never wrong. You're right. You get to decide whatever you want. Life is easy. We'll just give you whatever. Is that love? To me, yeah. it's not. To yeah, me, hell yeah. the, the scripture, what does it say in, in Proverbs? It says, if you don't discipline your son, you hate his soul. Wow, that's that's fucking deep, deep stuff right there. Crazy man. So, if let's take this this now this and and well, I'll paraphrase your words, these fat, 
feminine, lactating, pussy Christians that you said. These that I, it was your words, not mine, but I'll say it again. <laughs> th- those those men, how do they find this now purpose, this vision? How do they move forward from this place? How do they get stuck out of this rut? How do they light the fire back under their ass that is all over? The the these stories from the Bible you're talking about this these there are stories of fire in there all the time. How do they move forward? How do they find this purpose, this vision, this passion to become the man that they know that their family needs them to be, that their sons need them to be? Where do they, where do they go from here? How do they, how do they make that happen? Man, I always give four steps when guys go when guys ask that question. What do I do now? I think one you've always got to start with vision. The scripture says that without vision, people perish. There's a dying that happens on the inside. And you've seen it yourself. When guys don't have a vision for a brighter future, they just start living in the here and now and surviving and existing and just going, well, I'll just do this until I cross the finish line. Barely. I'll love my kids. It'll all be okay. But I'm not going to leave an impact upon the world. I'm not going to leave a legacy. I'm not going to leave an inheritance. I'm just existing. You need vision. Part of that vision is understanding and having a clear vision of who the father is and who the creator is. God is the vision of who you need to behave like and who you need to replicate. God is a warrior, yet God is a provider. God is loving, yet God is brutally ruthless with sin and separation from him and disobedience to his word. So I think recognize, one, who God really is. He's not some weak, mealy-mouthed individual that doesn't follow through on what he says he will do. So get a clear picture of God so that he can give you vision. But that vision is learning to listen to the voice of God inside. I said the other day on a podcast, I don't listen to what the pastor says. I don't listen to what the priest says. I don't do what the placard on the church sign says, because it's not their responsibility to hear God's word for me and to hear what God is saying to me. Now, I'm not saying they can't help give guidance. I'm not saying if their words don't line up with, if their words line up with scriptural truth, that you should just ignore it. So much wisdom comes through men that are further down the path than we are. I've been fathered by so many men that have spoken into my life, but ultimately I have one entity to please. I have one entity to show up to at the end of my life. Who's either going to say, well done, good and faithful servant or depart from me, wicked one. And so I am in that place of life where I finally got to that place of going, I'm tired of allowing other people to tell me what God's will is for my life. He speaks that to me individually. And so this is the voice that I have to learn from. So one, vision. But two, I think you need a father. We live in a fatherless generation, men who have not been taught how to be men. They don't know how to set goals, even draw out the vision that God has given them with clarity. They don't know how to earn. They don't know how to invest. They don't know how to keep themselves fit. And much of the time, if not most of the time, is because they didn't have a father to show them. And now we're living in a society where even fathers who are in the home, as we talked about yesterday, they're so obsessed with scrolling, Netflix, whatever distraction, that now we've just offloaded fathering our children. And I was in one of the places where when I started looking for fathers in my life actively, I have a great relationship with my dad. My dad's an amazing guy. My dad wasn't fathered and decided to change his family legacy and line by being a good father. But about my mid twenties, I got to that place where I just felt like I was hitting the ceiling on what my dad could teach me. And I love saying stuff like, you know, a bricklayer can't teach you electrician work. You're going to need different fathers in your life to help you walk into the next chapter of who you need to be and the impact that you need to have on the world. So get a vision and get a father, someone who can help you walk into the next step. Sometimes those things go together. I was having trouble visioning and getting a sense of purpose for my life and going, can I do this? And so I had to take the leap, invest with a father who could then help me uncover and excavate that purpose and those gifts and that vision that God had given me and helped me listen to it. So get a vision and get a father. But then third, get a brotherhood. Your version of normal, like your son right now, like you're talking about, His version of normal will be so vastly different from other people's version of normal because this is what he grew up in. This is why you run into adults where you see them behaving in their homes or the way their family interact. And you're like, dude, this is weird. This is dysfunctional, but it's their normal. So they don't know any different. You need to be held to a higher standard as a man by other men that will force you to grow and will not tolerate your bullshit. And that's a huge part of what I try to do more than anything is I'm not just coaching men. I'm plugging them into a community of relationships that will not allow them to compromise or stay where they're at. And we've seen it throughout history. We've seen it. I mean, if you were a high school athlete, I don't know if you were a high school athlete, 
you go and play with the big kids, you get bigger, stronger, and faster. But if you keep playing with the JV kids, you're going to stay at that level. And it's amazing how fast you will grow, elevate, and change with people who will hold you accountable, but also help with your growth. So vision, father, brotherhood. And then finally, you need an irrevocable commitment. You need to learn to burn the ships as a man. There is something that has been lost. And I think part of it is maybe even just our food supply. But anymore, people are scared to invest in something. They're scared to go in and plant a seed that then forces them to water it and make it grow. Whether you're investing in a program like the MDK Project, whether you're investing with a coach like, like myself or like you, or investing in an event like Freeman Forge 23 a couple, a couple weeks from now in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, you've got to make an irrevocable commitment that will not allow you to try to row against the current to get back where you were. So those four steps, vision, father, brotherhood, irrevocable commitment. Once those four things are in place, you have no choice but to grow. You put your back against the wall and there's only one direction to go. And that's up. Freaking awesome stuff there. And, and the bro and the brotherhood part that you're talking about is not those five men that you could take down yourself in that are just sitting in church being soft and passive and weak. Those are not the men you're talking about. That is not the brotherhood you're, you're talking about. And so what you are doing with the free men forge is trying to create that type of brotherhood, trying to create the, the kind of men that can go to war with you for a better future to be better husbands, fathers, leaders, and men. So let's, let's dive into the event itself here and just, just tell me about it. What, what are, what is this event going to be about? We've kind of went through this whole process, how we got to this point, how we got to this event, why this, this event, this type of event is needed. Why would, why would a man want to attend this? What should he expect? What are some of the outcomes that he's going to get out of this? What's he going to walk away with? How's this going to change his life? Like what, what should a man expect? Walking, right. out of the, walking out of the Freeman Forge event coming up in two weeks in Tennessee. Yeah, well, I would say I, I could go on the list of features is, is you know, as long as my arm. So if you want to know all the features, I would encourage you to get to freemanforge.com, just freemenforge.com. And there's an entire page there to tell you everything that we're doing, all the activities, all the inclusions. But what is important to me is the outcome. We've all been to, whether it be a church retreat or um, even something that'll give you more practical stuff that you can do, you get this emotional high. Then you go home. Well, now what? What am I supposed to do? What's the all, next? All the notes take? in the notebook, just collect dust on the fucking shelf. Exactly. And that's really where the brotherhood comes in. And so what we wanted to do was create an incredible experience where guys can not only enjoy themselves, for sure, we're going to have a blast. You're going to get high level networking with other men. And this is almost the most important part. You're going to be placed into a community of men who see the world the way you see it, who want to help shape the future that you want to shape and who are going to do it alongside one another. I can't count how many events I've been to where I watch guys and they're like, yes, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change my life. Come Monday, they don't have that new normal that has been set for them and that new culture of accountability and growth to actually help them walk that out. And another thing that has driven me crazy, and it, it's crazy when I was younger, um, just as a complete side note, I actually had a man, I don't know how much you believe in prophecy, but I believe that God speaks before things happen. Like the story about you going, God, what are you trying to tell me? I don't even know who I'm talking to right now. Just I'm, you're trying to tell me something. And then the phone call happens. That's prophecy. That's prophetic. That's something before it happens. There was a man when I was probably 17, 18 years old going through a really hard time. And he pulled me aside and he said, and I was leaning into full-time ministry at that time. He said, Gabe, people have been trying to help have you wear armor that doesn't fit you for a very long time. And God is going to give you something unique that fits you and touches men in a very, very unique way. And so for me, this is my ministry, but I don't want any part of any church retreat for a couple of reasons. One, I don't need a three-day church service. I love praying and singing songs and whatever else as much as anybody else, as long as it's a masculine song that makes me feel like I want to go to war. But I have no desire to do a, a relaxing retreat weekend with men when what we are in is the middle of a war. Whether we like it or not, we're at war. Even if we didn't see what's going on in the world around us, it's war against the flesh. It's war against weakness. Now we're seeing all of that stuff below the surface come to the above the surface where we can see it. It is time for men to get engaged and understand what they're doing and how to war. And that's what I think is the most important part of this is you cannot win wars without warriors. And unless we begin to not only enlist 
train, equip, and get these men engaged in the war, it is done. We have got to get men engaged in the fight. But many of these men, and this is part of what kicked me into doing what I do in 2020, was looking around and I, I was filled with this anger at men going, where are your, where is your junk? Why are you not doing this? And then I was filled with compassion. It's like God convicted me all of a sudden. And I, and my coach actually asked me a question. He goes, Gabe, how were you raised that was different? What was invested in you that was different? How are you able to fight? And it hit me at that moment and actually humbled me. And I went, even if these guys wanted to fight, they don't know how. So we want to send men home with the tools and the tactics to be able to take action now to get engaged for the war that we're in and the battle for what the future begins to look like. So we're, we've brought in not only trainers, teachers, and coaches, we're flying people from all over the country and even internationally to come teach. Men do not just know, need to know how to pray. They need practical tools for this world. They need to know how to invest their money. We're teaching investment. We're teaching a course called Wealth Warfare. We've got now, it's a big thing. You're seeing it yourself, pulling kids out of the public school system. Most parents don't even know how. The first response is, I, I would never know how to do that. It's because they're trying to mimic a system that is failing. It's because they think it costs a bunch of money and it doesn't. We can help guys understand how to pull their kids out of the system and educate their children in a way that will set them up for long-term success. My 13-year-old has a business where people out of the state are currently ordering her products, but that's the normal that I'm raising her in, and men need to know how to do that. We've got teaching on real estate and investment, and I already said investment, but real estate investment is different than just standard investment. We've got so much going on from just a teaching perspective about how men are supposed to walk this out that it's going to be mind-blowing. Not only that, but I mentioned we have intense networking sessions. So guys are being encouraged. Don't just show up with the workout clothes for the exercises we do in the afternoon, which I'll talk about in a second. But we want men to show up dressed right, looking good. You have six seconds for someone to make a judgment about you as to whether or not they're going to spend money with you, do business with you, work with you, whatever it may be. Men need to learn to show up at a higher level and your sweatpants and your Crocs aren't cutting it. You need to show up like you're someone worth working with and you need to connect with other men because your network is your net worth. This is a collaborative effort to help men grow. And a number of guys that show up will probably walk out with clients. Realistically, I hope that these men work together. We've got to stop doing business with the enemy. We got to stop handing our dollars to the opposition. If you were in war, there's no way you're walking across to the other line and you're handing food to the enemy. Stop doing that. We want men working together and exploding their businesses together. As far as the other things that we're going to be doing, just a snapshot of some of the physical things. We've got a, a performance pistol course led by an incredible performance uh, and production and speed shooter named Josh Gass. He's been winning awards all through the South. Men of Strength USA, if you follow him, along with Men in the Fray, are both coming out to lead a dynamic rifle course. We've even hired a national contractor to come out and built an entire enclosed shoot house. I'm talking entry doors, hallways, living room, bedrooms, bathroom, so that you in a situation can be trained step by step on how to clear a home if you had to do it to, to take care of your family or other loved ones that are in danger. And we've also got a really cool course that we decided to term practical violence. We have a guy coming all the way out from North Carolina who's a third degree Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. He's also very versed in a number of other things. He's going to be leading us through the ability and through some tools for hand-to-hand -hand combat if you need it. We'll have fights on Saturday night. You can sign up to box other guys. We've hired an award-winning chef out of Knoxville to cater an entire, an entirely animal-based menu. There will not be a seed oil or a GMO on site, and I'm bringing the raw milk from Texas myself. So all the lodging is included. I mean, we got fires at night. We got manly movies. We've got fireside mentoring times where men's coaches are coming from around the country to just share their wisdom around the fire at night. So if you are a man looking to elevate your life, not only is there no excuse for you to not be there, but if you're someone who has been longing for the last four years, almost 2020, I remember it, I was lonely and it, it was, I could not find other men around me that I could do battle with. It's coming back. We cannot get comfortable. You think this ain't coming back with how many people gave into it the first time? Now it's time to do something about it. You've got to link arms with men who you know are going to get in the foxhole with you, literally or figuratively, 
and wage the war ahead. Um, and so get there. The cost on the event, I won't, I hate even saying cost, it's investment. You will walk out of this with 20x to 100x of whatever you invest if you choose to take advantage of it. But get there. What you will walk away with will change the trajectory of your life permanently if you allow it to and if you make the decision to engage and get in with other men. This is a starting point, not an ending point. Hell yeah, you got me freaking fired up, ready to roll, ready to make this happen less than, <laughs> less than two weeks away. And there's still time for, for men to get involved. And everything you just mentioned is just the, the tip of the iceberg. It's going to be so much going on below physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. It's going to be fucking awesome. I, I, we can't wait for it. All right, so just give us the website one more time while we yeah. freemanforge.com. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah. we're also gonna, we're going to be by the way against the Smoky Mountain National Park. We're adjacent. So we'll be hiking up in there and I almost forgot and I had to jump in. One of the most important parts, we got Mr. Steve Eckert coming out, not only to light a fire under your butt by speaking, but I have a feeling there might be a little punishment dealt out as well. Oh, we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some fucking fun for sure. Can't wait. My yeah. specialty. But yeah, what's the website one more time? It's free men forge this F R E E M E N F O R G E.com. This is an application process. Get your application submitted immediately. Set up a call with one of our team members. We want to make sure this is not just full of men. We're not after numbers here. We're, we're after the right men with the right values that are going to be able to knit themselves together and move forward together. And so get on it, get on it right away. We've seen a real boom this week. The closer it gets, the more people are getting on board and going, I want in, I want in, I want in. So get on it. It's going to be a great time. Hell yeah, bro. I could sit here all day and talk about this shit with you, but we're going to, we're just here, here in a couple of weeks. Looking forward to it. Reach out if you need anything and we will see you next time. Yes, sir. Have a good one.